Hi, and welcome to this third little quickie. And I'm happy to say that this third little quickie is for a person that has been following what I've been doing for a couple of years now, and is probably one of my most ardent supporters. I don't know his name. All I have is his call name from YouTube. I'm not even sure where he lives, but I do believe he lives in France. So, for Deme, whatever or however that may be pronounced, this one's for you. Deme wants to know what influence the compound rest angles have on the thread cutting operation. So, we have three examples. Let's take a look at that. So, we have three parts and three different compound rest orientations. Zero degrees, 30 degrees, and 50 degrees. At zero degrees, the tool is going to plunge straight into the work surface. At 30 degrees, the tool is going to come at the work surface at a little bit of an angle, even though the tool itself is always perpendicular to the axis of the part. In the third example, the tool is going to be coming at the part at an even steeper angle. So let's take a look at what a first pass would look like. Now what I have here is notches that represent the tool groove as it cuts into the part. And we see that in the first pass, all three drawings, although they're not very good, well, they all should be pretty well identical. The grooves have no difference. They're identical in the first pass. It's in the second pass that things start to change. So if we took a second cut and increased our depth using our compound rest, what would it look like? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to draw it and we'll come back and explain it after. Now, I've drawn the second pass in red. So let's take a look. We can see that on the plunge cut, or the straight plunge cut, we have a thread that's widening equally on both sides, where the second groove is directly above the first one. And it's just penetrating. On the 30 degree plunge, well, we see that the thread is still properly formed, but that it's evolving to the left side for this right-handed thread. It gets a little confusing, but it is a right-handed thread because I'm cutting this way, but I'm cutting the leading flank here. And we see that we still have a proper 60 degree V. The difference being that this tool is cutting on both surfaces, whereas this one is cutting just on the leading edge, smaller surface contact. It works a little better for tougher materials. And on the third example, the 50 degree plunge, well, we can see that we don't have a properly formed tool. We're starting to get a step because our threading angle of 30 degrees on this trailing edge is smaller than the plunging angle. And that cannot give us a 60 degree thread form. Our leading edge will be at the proper angle but our trailing edge is going to become stepped. So I'm now going to draw the third pass and then we'll take a look at what that looks like. So I've drawn my third pass in green and I end up with something that looks like a Christmas candy cane. So I've completed my third pass and it's just more of the same. Uh, I've only done three passes and that's a th complete thread. Now often it'll take much more than three passes to complete a thread, but remember this is just a, an example. So if we look, my first pass at zero degrees, second and third, I'm just progressively penetrating deeper and deeper into the part and I'm guessing that seen as the crest seems well formed, that's where I'm going to want to stop. Uh, I've cut all the way through my cutting action with both cutting lips. So a maximum of surface contact and a maximum of cutting pressure. So probably not the best situation for tough metals uh, to be threaded with. 
uh, but plastics and some softer metals can very well be threaded with this plunging at zero degrees technique. In my second example, I'm plunging at 30, and I see that my third pass, again, is just the continuation of the two first ones. I have a properly formed thread, and my crest has arrived at the same place. Uh, so this thread is also complete uh, and properly formed. But the main difference here, and really the only difference, is that because I plunged at 30 degrees, I've been cutting solely on the leading edge of that tool. And that means a minimum of surface contact and the smallest amount of cutting pressure possible. So this would be a proper way of threading for materials that are difficult to cut. In the third example, the one that we're plunging in at 50 degrees, well, produces a thread that just isn't acceptable. It's stepped on its trailing edge and will never make or produce a viable thread. So 50 degrees is just not acceptable. So if I look at it as a whole, we can deduce from this that anywhere from 0 to 30 degrees will produce a properly formed thread with progressively less tool cutting pressure as we move towards 30 degrees. Anything over 30 degrees, and I mean anything over 30 degrees, will produce a deformed thread. And that's where the famous 29 degrees comes from. I want to make sure that I do not go past 30 degrees on my compound rest because the moment I do, I'm going to get a deformed thread. So I always suggest when I'm teaching to limit yourself to 29 degrees. And the only reason is to make sure that I don't go past 30. But that wasn't Demez's last question. There's a second little quickie in this third little quickie. So a little quickie 3.5. And that is, how does the compound rest angle affect the displacement of the tool when we're doing a, an accurate turning or surfacing operation? So I have two examples here. The first over here has a compound rest offset by 30 degrees from the cross slide axis. And the other example right here has a compound rest offset by 30 degrees to the longitudinal axis. How can that help my accuracy? Well, the first thing I want to mention about this is that it will have no impact whatsoever on the accuracy of your machine. Your machine is as accurate as it is. But what this will change is how accurately you can read the uh, scale on your compound rest hand wheel. Let's take a look at the first example here, 30 degrees from the cross slide axis. Now, I made a little sketch here that shows that sinus of 30 degrees equals 0.5. So, if I place my compound rest at 30 degrees, well, every time I advance my compound rest by a unit of one, one whatever you want, whether it's metric or imperial, let's say we're going to advance it by one inch, well, my longitudinal displacement will be 0.5, or half of whatever I moved on the compound rest axis. So if I move one in the direction of the compound rest, I'm going to advance 0.5. So I basically doubled what I can see here as far as precision goes on the scale of the hand wheel of the compound rest. If we look at our second example, this first one would have been for surfacing and it is by far the one that's most often used. This is rarely used and we'll explain why in a few seconds. But if we look at this second one, well, I have 30 degrees from the longitudinal axis and the same logic applies. If I move a unit of one, one inch example here, I'm going to advance the tool closer to my part by half that amount. So one inch, half inch. One thou, half a thou. And so on. This second method, however, is rarely used. And the principal reason for that is that the cross slide axis, or the cross slide lead screw, 
already on most lathes has a ratio of 0.5 to 1. And that means that it cuts on the diameter and not on the radius. What does that mean? That means that my cross slide axis, if I move the dial by 1, it's actually going to advance by 0.5 because it's going to cut 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the overall cut is going to be 1. So why go through all this trouble if my cross slide axis is already at a 0.5 to 1 ratio? In life, as the years go by, we often realize that too much of a good thing is or can be a bad thing. And in this case, it definitely is. A lot of people will say that, well, since I've reduced here to 30 and I can get a ratio of 0.5 to 1, why don't I go a little further and I'll be able to read the scale even more accurately. Actually, if you reduce this angle to 5.74 degrees, well, you get a ratio that's very, very close to 10 to 1. So that would mean that for every thousandths that you move at this angle, you'll advance towards the part by one ten thousandths of an inch. But in reality, that's just numbers on a calculator. Your machines are not that accurate. So don't blow your brains out trying to get very accurate angles here to be able to read very accurately your scale. This 0.5 to 1 is probably the smallest that you want to go with this kind of operation. Well, demain, I hope that answers your question. I was really happy to hear from you because it's been a while. And to everyone, happy machining. <laughs>